Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be invited to the Public Health Seminar on Human Rights. And what I'm going to look at uh, this afternoon is um, some issues from a philosophical perspective regarding what human rights are and how we should actually be looking to cultivate human rights. And in particular, to be looking at the way in which human rights are generated by ordinary people, or what we'll be referring to as human rights from below, that human rights are something which are very much associated with our given circumstances and within particular uh, sets of contexts. Now what I'd like to do is to um, provide almost a philosophical context for what Will's going to explore more pragmatically and practically, uh, pra practically in a moment when he looks at the Barton Moss protests. Now because I'm conscious of time, um, I'm going to largely read from my paper. So, uh, and I've only actually got one PowerPoint slide, so it's not going to be an all singing, all dancing kind of performance here. Um, but you can see the slide here, and I'll go into this as we go through with the paper itself. Okay, so the language of human rights is a commonplace one for those actively engaged in emancipatory struggles against inequality, domination, and state power. And it has long been associated with the perspectives of critical criminology and penal abolitionism. Critical criminologists locate the problems of crime within their socio-economic and political contexts, and also explore the manner in which harms are generated via the exercise of state power. Penal abolitionists, which is where this paper is very much closely associated with, explore and question the moral and political legitimacy of the current applications of punishment and specifically notions around <coughs> prisons today. And they call for ultimately alternative, non-punitive and non-penal ways of looking to address social harms and social problems. The focus of this paper and the way in which I'm going to be conceptualising and thinking about human rights can be described as one as focusing on the notion of moral rights or the moral philosophies around rights rather than a straightforward account in terms of legal rights. And therefore I want to explore a number of ethical I, uh, dimensions, a number of ethical issues which are looking to explore the notion of the relationship between rights and responsibilities and in particular the notion of rights and responsibilities for the other. Not rights in terms of ourselves, not rights for the self, but rights for the people and the ethical and political dimensions which are associated with that. And to do so from an abolitionist perspective, from the perspective of somebody who is questioning the very notion of punishment and the penal rationale. And indeed, as you will see, I would argue that a human rights approach is very closely associated with that perspective. Now, the language of rights has been championed by a number of critical criminologists and penal abolitionists in the UK who have argued that human rights can be a defensive strategy which can ultimately be utilised to protect us from violations of human dignity whilst at the same time also providing a vision, an idea of alternative utopian ways of actually moving forward. Something which has tied together ideas around human rights and in fact a lot, lot of the ideas regarding socialism and social eth socialist ethics and politics. And there are two broad ways of approaching rights in these different traditions. And these are the negative and the positive approach. And this will be largely what I'm going to be talking about in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. The positive approach 
which is a way of actually deducing human rights from values and principles and norms, is something which um, it will be the second part of what I'm going to explore. But the first part is notions around the negative approach. And this is where we identify human rights and human dignity through their violation. It is as if by noticing where dehumanisation and dehumanising practices exist that we can identify what it is to be a human being, what it is to actually be human. And this negative and positive approach is something which has been absolutely central to the abolitionist approaches to prisons, and particularly the negative approach, which is where I would like to start. So, the negative approach to human rights, that is trying to identify what our human rights entail by their violation, is something which has been very significant in terms of exploring penal practices. Because from critical approaches, uh, we can look at prisons as places of degradation, humiliation, and disrespect. We can look at the way in which human rights are violated and denied within the prison place. And therefore, that gives us some indication of what our human rights should be. For the abolitionist Michael Porowski, the prison place is an institution which will automatically undermine our inborn human dignity. For him, writing in 1991, Dignity will always be liable to suffer a certain damage as a result of the deprivation of physical liberty, the overall humiliating atmosphere of the prison, and the impossibility of eliminating coercion, supervision, lack of privacy, and the fact and symbols of subjugation. That the prison itself is a violation of our human rights. Indeed, for penal abolitionists, prisons present a clear danger to our common humanity. They desecrate our identity and sense of worth. Prisons, therefore, are steeped in a number of morally questionable actions which violate our dignity and common humanity. These include things like the focus on isolation, the lack of recognition of human identity, the monotony of daily penal regimes, the restrictions on liberty and movement which are essential to the daily workings of the penal institution, and at times the unwarranted use of physical force and violence. For the abolitionists, these human right violations, these degradations, are structured within the prison regime and its daily workings. That the most elementary and basic of human needs are removed. And that, in effect, it's impossible in the prison place to develop a sense of solidarity, sisterhood and brotherhood, which is essential to the very notion of what humanity entails. The prison becomes a situation where violence pertains, structured violence, violence which is the deprivation of need, violence which is basically about removing a person from their context and something which can lead to the breaking of the human spirit. Through its daily operations, the prison place destroys the natural flow of time. And this is the real issue, which is when it comes to thinking about prisons, it's about doing time. It's about thinking about the way in which the prison place distorts time, the way in which it impacts upon the way in which we become conscious of time, the way in which the pressure of time becomes almost too much for some people to bear. The notion of time consciousness, of time awareness. A more straightforward way of putting this is to say boredom. And when we're bored, we don't have to notice how long time goes on, don't we? I say this to my students all the time, 
when I'm doing a lecture, I said, you know what, you think we've been doing this for two hours, we're only 15 minutes in. This is what I mean by time consciousness. This is what I mean by time awareness. The fact that we feel time, the fact that we feel the slowness of time, and what the, the old phrase, that doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Because we become unconscious of time. We become <laughs> unaware of time. And this is what prison does. Prison makes us aware of time. And that time is monotonous, boring, it's wasteful. It leads to uh, an undermining of a sense of self. It leads to senses of loss, loneliness and despair. And quite frankly, the prison is a place which is structured to exhaust meaning. It's structured to exhaust and deny human relationships. And this is something which is fundamental because the prison becomes a tomb for the living and a graveyard for those who are unable to cope with prison time. Systematically, systematically undermining forms of mutual aid, respect and recognition, prison breaks connections with people on the outside. And in fact, it makes it even more bit difficult for people to build connections on the outside post-release. And this is what has been referred to as the notion of social death, that people are denied relationships. And this, of course, comes from the old ideas around slavery, where people were not only humiliated, but also the, and, and removed through um, what known as this natal alienation, removed from, from connections with their family, but also were subjected to a sense of loneliness, a sense of isolation, a sense of being out of control. And to some extent, this is why abolitionists are co so concerned about the prison place. And this is why they've been so interested in talking about human rights. Because human rights, in effect, offer us a narrative which can visualise and identify these different pointings. So, what we know is that as interrelated human beings, quite frankly, we need other human beings and we need other relationships to function effectively as, and in terms of our common humanity. The prison, though, places us in <coughs> a very, very difficult situation when it comes to forming those ties and relationships. First of all, the prison can be a place which leads to forced relationships, spending time with people that we don't like. And again, all of us can probably empathise with that notion that time can be very difficult to pass when we're spending it with people that we don't like so much or we don't feel as if we've got anything in common. But prison can push people together in those kind of scenarios because of its restrictive space, its coercive space. The person is also then estranged from their family and friends um, and is treated largely as somebody with mistrust and uh, suspicion. Prisons largely prevent any sense of real, genuine intimacy. You have this notion of one hand isolation, on the one hand, this removal from human relationships, and on the other hand, this forced relationship with people that you don't necessarily like, neither of which are particularly good for a person's health, neither of which are particularly good for somebody who actually can move forward. And it's this notion, this extinguishing of human rights, which is what the negative approach to human rights entails. It's by looking at these different aspects, by studying and exploring what is taken away from us as human beings, that we can start to realise what it is that we need. We can start to realise what it is that makes us human. So the negative approach is a way of looking at violation and then working backwards and saying, <coughs> hold on, actually, this is what somebody really needs to be a human being. And that's one approach within the actual human rights agenda, and one approach which has been deployed by abolitionists. But there is a second approach. There is a second notion, and this is where, once again, we can start to draw upon <coughs> some of the philosophical ideas around human rights. And I'm going to draw your attention in particular to uh, an Argentinian philosopher called Enrique Dussel, who hasn't been widely cited in the UK as of yet, but is somebody who I think is going to be of increasing prominence in terms of the ethical and political approach to thinking about human rights and transformative justice more broadly. Now, the positive approach to human rights is 
And this is why I'm going to try and bring in this notion of human rights for other people, human rights for the other. And I'll explain what I mean by the other in one moment. But this positive approach draws upon the notion of values and principles. This is more obviously in terms of what we're looking to achieve. It's not about what we're trying to abolish, it's what we're trying to promote, what we're trying to advocate here in this given context. And ultimately, it provides us with an idea of what rights entail, it gives us a language of what human rights would, in, would, be, would involve, and gives us this notion of this utopian um, inclusionary vision of what a human rights compliant society would actually look like. And for writers like Enrique Dussel, and also another philosopher I'd introduce you to, um, who's actually much more well known, certainly in ethical philosophy, is a writer called um, Emmanuel Levinas. And Levinas has been very influential in the last 20 odd years within sociological and criminological theory, particularly through its applications to the sociologist called Zygmunt Bauman. But the notion of Levinas and the notion of Dussel is that these human rights are achieved through struggle. And this will link, and I think, to what Will's got to say in a moment. They are linked through emancipatory uh, forms of action. They are something which is still to come. And therefore, the positive approach I'm going to be talking about is aspirational. It is not something which necessarily exists right now, but it's something that we are looking to achieve, something that we are looking to promote, something that would be an idea of what a moral basis for human rights and social justice would actually entail. Now, the basis of these writers here, of Levinas and Dussel, the basis of their approach to human rights comes surprisingly, perhaps, from debates around responsibility. And this is not notions of responsibility that are imposed upon people, i.e. what might be described as a responsabilisation strategy, a way of making us more responsible as individuals, but rather this ethical compulsion that we, as human beings, are actually responsible for other human beings. That we somehow, if we are interconnected, if we are what's known as intersubjective, that the idea that as human beings we are more than the sum of our parts, that we are people who need other people, that no person is an island, that we have this sense of actually needing to relate to other people. Well, with that, <coughs> for the writings of Levinas and Dussel, comes this sense that we have some kind of connection to those people. And in particular, the people that we have a connection with, the people where our responsibilities come from, are those people who are less powerful than us in a given set of situations. Those people in need. Those people who are in a situation facing trouble. And that's what they mean by the notion of responsibility. And this notion of the other, well, it's not just about another person or a different person. The notion of the other is about somebody who has been pushed to one side. According to Emmanuel Levinas back in 1969, the absolute other, and this is the other which we sometimes see with a big O, um, and it means a very specific category of person when you use the big O, is the stranger. <coughs> now the stranger is the outsider. The stranger is the person who's been pushed to the margins of society, the person who's not been let in. And of course, the prisoner would be one example of this in terms of the estranged other. But of course, migrants um, is another example of the stranger, the person being pushed out or not even allowed into society in this given sense. And for Levinas and for Dussel, the people who actually have the greatest pull on us the people for whom we have the greatest responsibility for, and henceforth to recognise their human rights, is the stranger, is the person in need, is the other, is the person on the margins, is the outsider, is the person without, is the person who has nothing, the person, not that we know, not that's part of our family, but the person that actually is in the greatest need. And that's, for them, is where our ethical obligations come from. 
Now, what this means is quite significant in terms of human rights. Because what they're talking about here is not just responsibility for the other, but human rights for the other. To recognise that other person who is on the margins, who is pushed to the outside as a fellow human being, and to treat them as such. And it is this notion of treating the other person as a part of our common humanity which is absolutely fundamental to this notion of human rights and moral rights. We're not talking about legal rights. We're not talking about international covenants here. We're not talking about legal um, codifications and jurisprudence. What we're talking about is this sense of moral commitment. What we're talking about this sense is who we seem to have this sense of connection to. Now, going back to the prisons for one moment, as I mentioned earlier, prisons are places which are immersed in human suffering. They're immersed in this sense of estrangement. The stranger and the prisoner are people who are the same in this sense. They are othered in the sense that we're referring to here. They are facing structural denials of needs. They are facing violations of human dignity. And therefore, the ethical responsibility for the prison place becomes quite fundamental and immense. Because if we look at this simply as the way in which we respond to other human beings, and if we look at this in the sense that if somebody is in need, if we can help them, the argument would be that we should, that this is what morality or ethics entails, and the recognition of these people as fellow human beings and human rights, if we can help them, we should. Well, the problem when it comes to looking at this in terms of morality in prisons is that the very structure of the penal regimes prevents that. No matter how good a prison officer is, no matter how much he or she wants to help a prisoner who is in need, they can't do it. They haven't got the opportunity because the prison place does not allow them to fulfil this point. And therefore we have these absolutely terrifying data right now of the way in which prison impacts upon human life. And we see this uh, horrible data of record numbers of people taking their lives in prison. For example, last year, 88 people took their own lives in prison. More than 250 people died in prison last year. This year alone, up until March, there have been 30 people who have taken their own lives. Data which came out only two weeks ago, looking at people who have attempted to take their own lives in prison, identified that in 2015, 20,000 people tried to take their own life in prison in the UK. That equates to one person in prisons in the UK trying to take their life every five hours. This is a serious damaging context and it's something which people, even the very best prison officers, find very, very difficult to actually meet this ethical demand, this responsibility um, to actually meet the notion as the person who is the other. And alongside this, it's about meeting people not through legal abstractions, not through actually any sense that this is a situation where we're trying to construct the human rights by codifications and, and lists. This is not that idea. It's about meeting human beings, which means meeting them as they are, meeting them where they are, meeting in the situational context that they're in, not about, did I meet regulation 5.2127? That ain't the way this works. Human rights is about human beings, and we all know that human beings are diverse. We all know that human beings are different. We all know that human beings have different and specific needs in different times, in different places, in different circumstances. And the prison, of course, from the abolitionist perspective, generates a remarkably large amount of need because it takes things away. It, it generates these notions of death, both corporeal, as I mentioned, and also social death. So it's about being actually recognising the contingency. It's about recognising the situation. It's about recognising human need. And particularly those people who are facing domination, repression and authoritarianism. And further, and this is a key point within the uh, arguments of Levinas and Dussel, this is not about you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's not about give and take. For them, the ethical relationship is about you do what you need to do in that situation. And if you get something back, great, fine. But if you don't, 
that doesn't mean anything because it's not about this notion of morality as reciprocity, which is the phrase that people use, that you reciprocate. For them, for these writers, ethics and human rights are not about this idea of that you do something and you get something directly back in return. It's not a gift or an exchange. It's about a non-reciprocal relationship. It's about helping and having responsibility to help that person in the situation that they're in at that given moment, irrespective of whether they can help you back. And of course, given that the argument would be that your responsibilities lie to those who are less powerful than you, then the likelihood would be that they're not going to be able to help you back because the, quite frankly is they're being in a very disempowered situation. Now where this leads us to, <coughs> in terms of, and I'll come to this, this point here, I'm almost getting through this now, I don't know if I have any idea what the time is, I'm supposed to read this and I've totally kind of just gone off, off key as we've gone through, I'm wondering about page Keep talking, Keep Keep talking. Talk. okay, <laughs> I'll try and wrap this up in a minute, I'll just abandon the last half. Um, so basically it comes out this notion of where we go in terms of hearing the voice of the estranged, or the, the prisoner, the estranged person, the person who's been moved beyond. And this, this sense, we need to think, in the, certainly in the work of Enrique Dussel, around notions of both the, um, the material principle and what he calls the formal principle. And the formal principle is about hearing voice. It's about making sure that people's voices can actually be heard, that there are safeguards in place. Because for people like Dussel, silence, and when you're denied voice, is actually quite a significant problem. In fact, and they would argue that it leads to the problem of, of, of violence itself. To be denied voice for them would actually be considered as an expression of violence because it is so damaging to the individual. And we all know that, that we're not allowed to speak, how frustrating that can be. And if that happens on many, many occasions, then of course that can be something which has a ne negative impact on that person's well-being. And that's what they mean by violence. So not only does it way of actually exploring pain and suffering, but for the English scholar Elaine Scarry, who wrote a book in 1985 called The Body in Pain, which has been an absolute classic in terms of it's describing pain and suffering more broadly. Elaine Scarry put it this way in terms of the relationship between pain and suffering and voice. And yes, of course, when we do speak, that is a way of actually expressing our pain and, pain and suffering. But pain and suffering can actually be much more destructive than what we think. And what Scarry argues on page four of a book, physical pain does not simply resist language, but actively destroys it, bringing about an immediate reversion to a state of anterior to language to be the sounds and cries a human being makes before language is learned. And when I was reading this, what came in my mind was what would it be like if you were standing around in the aftermath of the song which I know is um, about 100 years ago now, and you just hear the cries of pain, and you'd hear that almost inaudible and unspeakable notion that you knew somebody was in trouble because you could hear the suffering, but they couldn't speak, they haven't got the ability to speak, they can only mourn. And that's what she means by the way which suffering can destroy voice. It makes it very, very difficult to actually articulate what we actually are feeling. And she argues that places of suffering generate that. And what she means by this more broadly is that we become unable to articulate our pain because we can't talk about it. The pain becomes unshareable. So this notion of voice as being part of human rights and hearing the voice of those people who are suffering in all sorts of different dimensions and contexts, the other and the estranged person and the person on the outside and all these different ways, not, not just in terms of prison, it actually destroys the dominant discourse. It destroys people's language and it makes it very very difficult for people to move forward. Now alongside this um, and this importance of a human rights agenda which is looking to ultimately move forward is to have, and I'll come on to the third point now, is to have this human rights from below, is to have this sense of actually not just hearing voices and not just recognising that actual um, needs are being met but also to partake in emancipatory struggles. And this is why I think this paper will lead in, and from a philosophical point of view, into what Will's going to talk about in a moment. Because it's about not just actually recognising that asymmetry, not just recognising our responsibility for people who are in a much more disempowered position than ourselves, but actually doing something about it. Actually being prepared to engage. And this is why I particularly like Enrique Dussel. 
because Dussel has that ethical dimension which he takes from the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, but he has a very, very clear notion of our political responsibility to engage, our political responsibility to be involved in emancipatory struggles, to not just to give and not just to help, but to transform, to be part and active agents in actually taking things forward, to not just allow that asymmetry to exist, to not just feel that we are responsible for helping and ameliorating those given forms in terms of a humanitarian response, but also that we are actively, politically um, entrapped within this very notion and that relationship between the powerless and the powerful. That the notions of justice, that the ideas of justice and human rights are all about actually promoting a transformative political agenda that looks to challenge these issues, that looks to challenge these forms of social exclusion, social injustice, that looks to challenge notions around structural violence, and that looks to promote these ideas around what we've come to in terms of um, the common humanity of others. So, to conclude, for penal abolitionists, human rights are something which is about responsibilities for the people. They come from below. They come from ordinary people in situational context. They are not imposed from above by lawmakers. They are not about legal covenants. They are about situations, about recognising the common humanity of another human being, responding to that, ameliorating and looking to provide humanitarian change, but also to recognise that that situation could well be wrong and it needs perhaps to be abolished. It needs perhaps to be actually, to be ended. And I think on that point of endings, I think I better end myself. Okay, thank you very much.